Greetings, this is Dr. Neumeyer, and this video is on the clinical skills of the MMPI-2. Um, thus far, we've covered an overview of the MMPI-2, we've covered um, the validity scales, and now we're talking about the clinical scales. And so just again to, to remind us that we are not going to look at the clinical scales unless we have a valid profile. So as I talk about um, the, the uh, clinical scales today, keep in mind that um, the meaning of the clinical scales can only be understood as being valid if uh, all the assumptions uh, have been met on the validity side and the validity scales are, are not indicating that there is a problem in interpreting the clinical scales. If you run into that, you are done. You cannot interpret um, the, uh, the clinical scales and you shouldn't really even look at them. Uh, again, I will not spend a lot of time on this. This is just a quick overview to help you again dial in to uh, the process of understanding the MMPI and how to use it. Uh, and uh, I will be making some comments um, that will um, be in alignment with uh, your, your book, uh, Mar Groff, Marnot, and Wright Text Handbook of Psychological Assessments. They have a great um, chapter on the MMPI. So scale number one is the hy hypochondriasis scale. Uh, and so again, we're looking at um, measuring um, and trying to understand people's understanding of their body and how it relates to their states of pain um, or discomfort. Um, or their understanding of illness and disease that is, has it has impacted them. The MMPI is mostly looking at uh, measuring chronic or enduring or persistent kinds of um, processes. And so the hypochondriasis scale is not looking at, at somebody who's maybe just had a brief encounter with, um, say, a, a series of migraines that lasted for a few weeks but it's again looking at more of a, a longitudinal or long-term understanding of how the client re relates to their, their body, the physical world, and their sense of pain. Second scale is the dis depression. Um, and so uh, I, one of the big advantages in my estimation is in the new uh, MMPI, the MMPI 2RF, is that um, depression is broken out into some substrata. And depression is such a large category. What do we mean when we say depression? It, it feels almost like a generic term. And so um, it is. It is. It, depression has a lot of subtlety um, in it. And so um, I, I'm glad for that move forward. But um, so you just have to take this a little bit as a, as a grain of salt um, that it's covering the whole topic of depression and so there's there you could have a high elevated depression score and really still not understand what's driving your client without good follow-up and good diagnostics uh, around that scale you typically do not see de the depression scale elevated on itself uh, it's usually elevated with other scales Scale three, hysteria or, uh, is the scale. Uh, again, um, as I read that even out loud, I'm reminded to myself that the reason we moved away from calling these scales by names like hysteria was and relabeled them with numbers like scale three, scale four, etc., was to move away from some of the labeling language. This is certainly is not a term that any of us probably use in our professional world. <laughs> we may use it um, in some kind of colloquial manner, but certainly we don't use it in report writing or anything like, or, or talking about our clients and notes or treatment planning. Um, so we're kind of again measuring somebody who has a maybe a high degree of sensitivity, um, and that sensitivity could even be in alignment with scale one um, around their own physical complaints. Scale four is um, psychopathic deviant. So this is somebody, when we see uh, this scale elevated, it's especially much greater than um, a standard deviation and a half. We're starting to think of things like uh, antisocial personality disorder, or people with um, some severe symptomatology, especially if it's elevated alongside other scales like scale eight, scale nine. And that brings me up to a, a good point that I'll just mention at this slide, at this point in this slide. Uh, and that is um, your goal, as you've figured out already, in understanding and getting the most traction uh, of the MMPI is to not be looking at these scales 
either the validity scales or the clinical scales in isolation, but it's what do they tell us when we put them together. So um, imagine, uh, imagine an artist who just paints with the color green. Well, a, a, an artist who's really, really good at painting or, or doing artwork could, could really do something much better than you and I could do with just one color, with the color green. But imagine if they had green and blue and yellow and red, and then they had shades of all those colors, how much more they could paint. And in the same way, um, an elevated psychopathic deviant scale um, is, is helpful, it's interesting to us, but we're mostly interested in understanding how that scale works um, and the story it tells us alongside all the other scales, elevations uh, on the MMPI, especially the clinical side, if we've got a, a valid profile. And so the most common way then that we begin to look at, um, at, at interpretation is to look at the highest elevation uh, elevated scale. So that usually um, we are call this a two code. So we look at the two highest. Maybe if there are three codes that are elevated uh, 65 or above or close to 65, then we do what we call a three code. And so there's lots of material out there that will say if someone has an elevated four, say say, say the four is at 68 and the nine is at, is at 70, we call that a four nine. And, and and then what does that cluster of those two elevations on those scales mean for us as we understand the client? So people that have been doing research and looking at this for long enough have written nice narratives for you and nice descriptions. And so you may look at your own uh, MMPI profile and while you may not have anything that's elevated above the 65th percentile or 65th T score 65, it may be maybe you had your two highest scores on the clinical side are a 63 and a 57. Okay, so you're probably not in any kind of serious psychopathological range or any kind of serious range, but so it's more talking just about personality traits and styles. So you may you may look at those two scales and look at the pattern that is described in one of your texts, like a 4-9, and, and back that down. So what if your 4 is a 62 and your 9 is a 60? Well, what does a 4-9 four, four look like that's high on those, and what does it look like if you have both of those in, in a more functional range? In other words, how does that fit in understanding yourself? Um, scale 5, again, is the masculinity-femininity scale, which was attempted to try to help us understand uh, gender differences as well as try to help us understand um, individuals who may be expressing same-sex attraction. Um, there's some, there's some, some merits to this scale as well as some, some real difficulties with this scale, so I'm always somewhat conflicted when I talk about this scale because I, I, um, I think it does kind of help us have conversations about, about gender and about roles and how your clients or individuals are approaching um, the topic. I think I might have mentioned in a previous um, presentation that sometimes when I see men who um, are, endorse this scale in a capacity that presents as extremely or overly masculine, it sometimes becomes a facade indicator and in that they're really um, dealing with issues of same-sex attraction and um, trying to keep a lid on, that, on those things by pre presenting themselves in an overly macho uh, manner. And so... Um, the scale, even though it's not on the, the new MMPI, the MMPI 2RF, um, because of those kind of facade indicators, I, I feel like I've, I've lost a little information, but I, I think there's probably many other ways to get at it, too. S scale 6, you could see how scale 4 was elevated with scale 6. You could have some problems, so you've got somebody who's uh, maybe... Um, paranoid um, with um, antisocial features as, uh, as maybe indicated on scale four that would be a difficult client um, usually to work with in treatment. A little paranoia is good. Um, <laughs> perhaps I say that because I tend to fall more in like the in the, in the probably in the in the 56 to 60 range so maybe I'm uh, I'm justifying my own uh, uh, my own 
profile a little bit. Cyclosthenia. So cyclosthenia, this scale was originally uh, to assess um, conditions that might be characterized as somebody with excessive fear or doubt or even um, it's been used to look at obsessive compulsive disorders. Scale 8, schizophrenia. Um, so again, the scale was originally developed to measure individuals who might be um, having severe um, or bizarre kinds of uh, sensory experiences or, or, or thought distortions. Hypomania, or sometimes just mania, the mania scale, scale 9, um, is thought to, sometimes we call this the energy scale, so um, we can't kind of look at this in relationship oftentimes to other elevated scales. So again, if somebody has a, a lot of energy, has a lot of like capacity to do things as indicated by the scale 9, we get a little bit more worried when we see other scales um, that are significant elevated alongside the scale 9. Whereas if sometimes scales are elevated but scale 9 is fairly flat, then we know that maybe some of the things that are driving maybe paranoid thinking um, won't get acted out on uh, just because the client doesn't have that high drive to do that. And then of course the last scale is the social introversion scale, so trying to look at how people um, fit in and respond in social situations and how they perceive um, their interactions with others. I might call this the introversion extroversion scale. So again my point in this presentation is to quickly run through these and to then get to maybe a case vignette, one case vignette, and help us understand how the MMPI might um, work. And so here we have an individual who has worked at a nuclear power plant, caught smoking marijuana in the bathroom, so he was released from his job, allegedly got treatment for his problem, and so after, three days after completing treatment, he's reapplied for his job. And so the question is, is he ready to, for work? And so the employee assistant program um, refers uh, this client or this individual to you for, some, for an evaluation, and you decide in addition to a, a structured interview to maybe use an MMPI to help you gather information and assess this individual's readiness to go back to work. So here would be an MMPI profile that you might get. I um, don't know if I have um, all the scores plotted in there. Nope, I don't. I just kind of am going to zoom in here a little bit for you. Um, and so when we look at the, um, the L and the F and the K, the first thing we we recognize is that they are all below the 65, uh, T-score 65, so we could probably be pretty safe that this is an individual um, whose uh, profile is valid. We don't see really anything alarming on the, on the validity side that would invalidate the profile. So that means then that we can come over now to the clinical scales and feel like that they are trustworthy representation of this particular individual. And of course, um, we notice right away that we have an individual who was elevated on both scale four, clearly above the T-score of 65, and then the next elevation, although up, uh, not above 65, is certainly approaching 65. And so if we just went with the two scale um, kind of interpretation of this, we would be looking at a 4.9 or a 9.4. So maybe somebody who's feeling um, um, isolated or alienated, uh, maybe somebody who tends to be somewhat antisocial, um, likes to indulge himself or herself, um, maybe someone who um, Relation, has a lot of relationships, but they're all shallow and, and, and not deep. Um, and um, so the question would become, 
then is this a profile that you would say is someone who is ready to return to work in a nuclear power plant? Now, don't let the word term nuclear power plant freak you out. Everyone who works in a, in a power plant does not have access to um, send the cooling rods into a scram mode and, and, and create a, a catastrophe. <laughs> there are many people that work in a in large industry and settings that are um, not as stable as we would like, but because they don't have access, um, don't create a threat to a society. So is this somebody who would be likely to return to work? I guess you'd have to look at the, uh, all the other pieces of the structured interview. But again, because it's a valid clinically, I think it's the person has not tried to be, uh, the person has tried to present themselves in maybe, maybe a slightly overly favorable light, which you could see if you're being assessed to go back to work, but yet it's still within a normal realm. So I would say this person has given me a valid profile and I'm a little bit concerned about that high four. Um, but, uh, and that would be something to be kept, keep kept in mind. So uh, assuming everything else is good, that he really has completed treatment and that the individual is, is staying clean and sober and that you can document that some way and that there's a, um, a structured interview that goes along with that, that you feel comfortable that this client is uh, moving in a good direction. I probably would recommend that this individual would be a candidate to return to work with the proviso that they continue to be monitored and that and the recommendations might be you know um, free, frequent uh, random urine toxicology screening as and maybe ongoing counseling or therapy um, likely paid for by the employee assisted program at, at that at that industry um, so that would be how I would look at it. Nothing else is really elevated other than the four and the nine. So there's nothing really particular to pay attention to there. Um, or nothing to, nothing to talk about. Actually all pretty close to the mean or within a normal range. Okay, so um, this is just one case example. I, I'm free to post more of these if they're helpful to you and help you talk through them. I hope this uh, presentation has, has guided your work in the MMPI.